Don't study logic. Brown. I'm Brandon Lyles. And I'm Stacy Loveland. And we're excited to have you join us for Colonial Williamsburg's CW Kids Ask. Where we dive deep into history. Together, we'll explore 18th century life and connect it to present day experiences. We'll look at everything from fashion to science. And economy to archaeology. We'll take a closer look at our past and present. Join us each month on our live streams and submit your own questions or watch past episodes and start your own conversations. The past has something for everyone. So come join us as we discover the past. How did the colonial economy work? Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us today for this episode of CW Kids Ask. This is our monthly live stream just for students where we will explore 18th century life and learn about the people, events, and ideas that helped shape America. Each month we will bust some myths and misconceptions, explore primary sources, and answer questions that you all send to us in the chat. I'm Brandon Lyles and today we're going to answer the question, how did the colonial economy work? Joining me today, we have Emily Doherty, Cash Earhart, and Rebecca Starkins. Uh, let's get started by having you tell us a little bit about yourselves. My name is Rebecca Starkins. I am the journeywoman, milliner, and mantua maker in our historic trades department. So as a milliner, that means that I'm somebody who's trained in the making and also the selling of all of the accessories for the entire family's wardrobe. As a mantua maker, that means I'm trained to make fitted clothes for ladies. So if you need anything special, we would be the people you'd come to see in terms of fashion. Hi, I'm Emily Doherty. I'm an actor, interpreter, and a programming lead here at Colonial Williamsburg, and I portray three different women who lived in the 18th century. Uh, everyone from the first uh, appointed governor, Patrick Henry's second wife, Dorothea Henry, to a tavern keeper named Rachel Whitaker, and even a convict servant named Harriet Bateman, and all three women, though they were in very different social places, participated in the economy here in the 18th century. I'm Cash. I'm usually over at the Capitol building where I get to speak with folks about laws and taxes. And today, I'm really excited to get to speak with you about everybody's favorite topic, money. <laughs> Well, thank you all for, so much for joining us. Uh, since we're talking about the economy today, let's take a look at what the economy looked like here in Virginia in the 18th century. Hi, I'm here on the side of the exchange. In the 18th century, anyone coming into town or into the colony could come and meet with men gathered here to exchange currency, learn about the current exchange rates, and take care of anything else necessary to participate in the Virginia economy. This is an incredibly visible part of Virginia's economy, and it is literally in the middle of the street leading to the capital. This is just one part of the economy in colonial Virginia, though. Virginia was a colony, which means that Virginia was part of the English Empire. Free people living here were considered subjects of the English king, and goods that were produced here were often sent back to England. England maintained colonies to produce raw goods like lumber and tobacco, which could be sent back to England to be processed and finished before being sold both in England and throughout the English colonies, including the colony the raw materials originally came from. Here in Virginia's colonial capital city, we are surrounded by all sorts of people engaging with the economy every day. As you look down the street, you'll find trade shops, the market house, taverns, many of which are owned by women, stores, merchants, and people looking to spend money, make money, produce goods, and navigate and survive the economy. But as exciting as this part of the colonial economy is, most Virginians didn't live in the capital city. Most lived on farms where agriculture played the most important role in their economic lives. Hi, I'm Ed Schultz. I'm Colonial Williamsburg's historic farmer. 
and the work that I do represents you, the historical you. Most people in the 18th century are farmers. That's free and enslaved, over 90% of people. And their prosperity depends on this. The whole economy turns on the farmer. The things I actually grow here as a tradesman is corn is our daily bread. This is what we eat ground up. And tobacco, this is for money. And when the war comes, this whole thing collapses and we have to grow cotton for our own clothes. The tobacco is everything to the Virginia economy here. It is everything to making a living here. Now this plant here is getting close to cutting. It's about two weeks, maybe 10 days away here. You can see it here, the way it curls over. It's got actually got a certain sound to it and a texture, a feel to it. Now when this plant is completely ready, what I do is I take my knife here and I cut it. This is just one of many processes that has to be done. So you hang up the plant and you'll cure it in a barn. And you look at that, isn't that beautiful? After it cures, which is a drying process, it will look like that. This is money right here. Tobacco is all about three things. It's about land, it's about the crop itself, and it's about labor. So where did this labor come from? It comes from you, and then your family, and then it also has indentured servants. But that's a term of service, five to seven years or so. And then they turn to slavery, which is for life. It's important for us to remember that human beings made this choice to turn to slavery. It wasn't a crop, it was human beings. Tobacco is an incredibly labor-intensive crop. There's all kinds of things you have to do, and everybody did these, from kids to adults. One of the major things you gotta do is keep it from getting eaten. Looky there. There's a tobacco horn right there. If I fool around and don't pick them off, then that will eat half my plant here. The other thing that you do is you have to pick all the suckers off. Once you top it, break the top out, all these little suckers form here. And I'll tell you what, little hands are really good for this. See, I gotta bend over as an old guy, but if you're a kid, you're just the right height. And so you pull all these off here and just cast them aside. They're no good leaves here. You get rid of the suckers. Inevitably, once you've cut it and cured it, you've got lots of these right here. You've tied them into these beautiful hands. This is cured tobacco. The last thing after 13 months of work is you put thousands of these together and pack it in this hogshead right here and this will be put on a ship and goes to England. You'll never see it again. So this is farming. Everybody did this kind of work that I've shown you today here. The labor, remember, is everybody. From little kids, say third graders or sixth graders, on up to my size, young and old. They're both free people and enslaved people. Everybody did this work here. It is the center of the economy of Virginia. Welcome back. Please send in your questions so we can answer them live. Now, to get us started, Ed talked about how enslaved people worked to grow tobacco, but, but we often get questions about enslaved people working to grow cotton. Uh, can you all talk a little bit about how slavery fit into the tobacco economy and why we're talking about tobacco instead of cotton? Absolutely. Uh, tobacco was the first cash crop, the, the first agricultural product produced in Virginia for the English colonists that produced a profit. So they began to try to get as many colonists from Europe, and specifically from England, to come to Virginia to grow tobacco, but they weren't able to get enough. So they began importing folks from Africa. They may have already been sent to the Caribbean or South America as slaves, but then they were being brought into Virginia for lifetime servitude in, in bondage to work tobacco 
and other crops in, in other colonies as well. After you get past the American Revolution and then there's some technological innovations, you begin to see cotton uh, take over as the number one cash crop in the United States, not just Virginia, but the entire country. Uh, and I would like to point out that um, Ed mentioned that it was a choice. Having enslaved people do this manual labor here in Virginia was a choice that was made. And the economy, as we know it in the 18th century um, here in Virginia, does not exist without that choice being mm -hmm. made. Um, so it was a deliberate choice, and it, w it became the backbone of the Virginia economy. Yeah, and those individuals um, who, as children, might have been working in tobacco fields, as adults would have been those individuals that would have been participating in that economy that, especially here in the South, revolved around cotton. But right before the revolution, during the revolution, most of the cotton that we're wearing here in the colonies is actually coming as an import. So England is bringing it to us and they're sourcing it from places like India and Turkey and Egypt and they're exporting it here to us in the colonies. Excellent. And what, what types of money are people actually using in the 18th century? Ooh. Well, um, there's lots of different types of money here in the um, uh, being used, uh, both uh, from lots of different places. Um, you do have English money, Spanish money, Portuguese money, but also there are things like tobacco notes, where um, if you have a certain amount of tobacco that is down at a warehouse, you essentially get a certificate that says, this is how much tobacco I have. Um, this is the um, quality of that tobacco, and then you take it to a city like Williamsburg and you can shop it around and see how much credit you can get for it. And the most desirable form of, of currency or money that folks could get their hands on would have been gold or silver coins like these. And I think we've got a, a picture of a silver coin to show you. That is a Spanish milled dollar. That's the most commonly circulated coin. That means there's more of that kind of coin in Virginia than anything else, even though it's coming from Spain. And that sort of coin, you could cut into pieces. You could take it and cut it into half and make a half dollar if, if you needed to make change for someone even. Uh, you could also have treasury notes. These are, these are pieces of paper that have been printed by the government and can be circulated if you don't have enough ready money, if you don't have enough gold or silver laying around uh, for the government to be able to pay all of its bills. They could print some of those treasury notes instead. Now, I know one other form uh, that, that often gets talked about is credit. Now, can one of you describe, I mean, tell us what is credit? Yeah, in millinery shops like the one that I work in today in the 18th century, um, credit would have been probably the primary form of economic exchange. And if you all think about the way that your parents will pay for things in stores today, quite often they'll just take out their credit card and it doesn't really have any monetary value. But what it essentially is, is that promise that that money will get paid back to that merchant, to the person who's doing the selling in the future. So it's just a promise of future repayment, a promise that that cash will get exchanged eventually down the road. Wonderful. And please uh, keep sending in your questions. We will be answering them live on air. Uh, however, I do have one last question just to get us started. How does money back then compare to money now? now? <laughs> that's, that's a really great question. And it's, it's one that is very complicated, but it has a simple answer. I can't <clears throat> tell you how much something is worth in 1776 in our dollars and cents today. Uh, George Washington never had to make a car payment on, on anything. He didn't have to pay for health insurance. So just the sorts of things that he had to buy and spend money on are so different from what we have today that making those uh, equations balance out just, it, it doesn't work out today. Yeah, the short answer is we can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> what we, so much fun. <laughs> what we can do, though, is tell you how much something is worth back in 1776, mm -hmm. though. Uh, a meal in a tavern here in Williamsburg would cost you one shilling. Mm -hmm. One of these small silver coins. 
That shilling is one twentieth of a pound, and somebody that works in a shop might earn 30 or 40 pounds in a year. So that's not an insignificant amount of money compared to what somebody might make in, in a whole year, or even you know, a day's labor. That's an interesting way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some, uh, some questions coming in now. Um, there's one that uh, I see that says, how much did, other, ev how much did everyday items cost? Huh. So um, it, like Ash was saying, it's hard to uh, equate it to today's money, but you could say, um, uh, for example, if you were going to eat at a tavern, you could have that standard meal that might cost you one shilling, as we mentioned earlier, or if you had some extra money, you can always upgrade your meal or your lodging if you want to. So it costs as much as you're willing to spend, if that makes sense. Um, just like today, if I'm traveling and I have three options of hotels to stay at, I might have one that is a little shabbier than what I want to stay in, one that's right in the middle, and one that's too expensive for me. I'm going to self-select which one makes the most sense for me. And that's the same thing people were doing in the 18th century. Yeah, it's, one, it's, it's just like today where you have basically the same thing that can be available at a full range of prices from, you know, the luxury version of something to the cheap knockoff to everything in between that can basically make that, um, that item accessible to everyone within that economic community. And clothing is a good example of that in the sense that um, clothing has a set value when it comes to the labor costs. So what are you going to pay somebody to make a gown or make a suit for you? That is a set cost, but the cost of the fabric is entirely up to you as the customer. So if you want really expensive clothes, bring us really expensive fabric. It takes us the same amount of time to turn that fabric, you know, whether it's cheap or whether it's, it's very expensive, into that same identical garment. And that idea of everyday items, it's going to depend on who you are. Mm -hmm. If you're the royal governor, you know, it's not uncommon for you to have pounds and pounds of chocolate sitting in, in your house, which is a very expensive commodity. If you are an enslaved person, you might not have chocolate in a whole year or, or longer than that. Uh, you might never get to try it. So just the ability of folks to enjoy different necessities and different luxuries in life will depend on their station, their, their position in society. Wonderful. <clears throat> and we have a, a question coming in from a fifth grade class in uh, San Diego who asks, how are the colonists paid for their crops? That's a really good question. Um, so there's a, a lot of different things to look at there. First of all, like we mentioned earlier, the people who might actually be taking care of the crops might actually not be the ones getting paid. If you're an enslaved person working on property, it's your job to take care of the crops, but you're also considered property. So you're not the one who's going to get the money for that. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that there's such a thing as a tobacco note, which is one way you might get paid, um, and it just transfers the tobacco that you have, um, you have harvested to somebody else's name, and in return, you get to go to a shop and um, buy what you want with the credit from that tobacco. Um, there are other uh, ways you can be paid. I don't know, um, Cash, if you'd like to speak about uh, the exchange at all. Uh, sure. Uh, in the video that you saw earlier, Brandon was talking about the exchange. That's an area in the main street of Williamsburg, over near the Capitol building, where merchants, uh, store owners, folks who trade in tobacco would get together and kind of work like a stock exchange. If you've ever seen pictures of the stock exchange in New York where they, they ring the bell and people start shouting numbers at each other. It would be kind of like that over here in Williamsburg uh, where folks would decide, hey, there was a lot of tobacco this year. Let's make the price on it be a little bit lower. Otherwise, we're not going to sell it all. <coughs> or there could be a year where there's a terrible drought there isn't that much tobacco, they might set the price to be really high on the tobacco because there isn't as much to be sold. Uh, th that idea of supply and demand. If you don't have a whole lot of something, that makes it more valuable. 
So they would set the exchange rates over uh, at the Capitol building, and that would cause some of these coins, you know, this uh, Spanish mill dollar, it might be worth five shillings and eight pence here in Virginia, but perhaps in Pennsylvania, it's worth seven shillings. Back in England, it might only be worth five shillings. So not only the stuff we're producing, the tobacco could fluctuate in price, could vary up and down, but even our money from one place to another could change. Excellent. And the fifth grade class from uh, San Diego is also asking, why was the Spanish coin more popular in Virginia than in California? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. <laughs> well, so the Spanish had, had colonies set up in Central America and in South America for, for hundreds of years, even before the first English colonies were established in North America. And they had had the indigenous population there in Central America uh, mining gold and silver for them and sending it back to England and, and uh, I'm sorry, sending it back to Spain and making it into coins that then spread out all over the world. It doesn't matter that this coin came from Spain or that it might have a picture of the king of Spain on the coin. What matters is that it's made out of silver or in this case, made out of gold. Uh, and there were more European colonists living in Virginia during our period of time that we talk about in 1776 than, than there were in California. Most of the inhabitants out in California at this point were Native American peoples who, although they might have traded some with the Spanish colonists out in that area, it wasn't the same kind of numbers that you see here on the East Coast. So just to clarify, it's all about what it's made out of mm -hmm. and how much it weighs mm -hmm. rather than what is printed on it. Exactly. Onto it. And once you get a coin, you know, if you had a coin like this that's been cut in half, how would you figure out what it was worth? Well, you would have to weigh it. You would take a set of balance and weights like these. So I've got some weights on this side of the balance and I've got a couple of coins over on this side of the balance. And when that needle points straight up and down, that lets me know how much that coin weighs. But once you've got the weight of a coin, does that tell you how much it's worth? Now for that, you would need a chart, kind of like the one that you can see on your screen now. That was printed in an almanac all the way back in 1749 here in Williamsburg. So you could look to see on that graph, here's how much that coin weighs in gold or silver, and then it would tell you how much it was worth. Excellent. And we do have a lot of people asking for more clarification on how we can understand how much things cost in the 18th century. Uh, Megan and Christian are both asking about an average daily wage versus what a person might make in a year. Mm -hmm. And Diamond in Mrs. Wise's class is asking how much food and drink would cost for a person. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll start out just by saying that as a tradesperson, as somebody who works with their hands for a living, who sells the skill set that they have, in my trade as a man tool maker, as a dressmaker, I would make about two and a half to three shillings. So remember earlier Cash was talking about how a meal in a tavern would cost you one shilling. It takes me one whole work day to earn two and a half to three of those shillings. But I work a six day week, which means over the course of that six day week, I'm going to make probably between 15 and 18 shillings for my wage. So that'll just give you a sense of kind of a loosely average tradesperson's wage. Um, I portray a tavern keeper, and a tavern in an 18th century is a place that you go for food, drink, and lodging. That means a place to stay. So it's sort of like a hotel today, except for you also have to serve food and drink. Now the question of how much does that cost, um, I can give you the simple answer, which is um, it's, it's about a shilling. Um, every year the courts are going to meet and determine how much a basic meal should cost. That's so if you're traveling through a space, a county in the 18th century that only has one tavern, they're not gonna overcharge you to stay in that one tavern. All the taverns have to charge the same for a basic uh, meal and a basic room. 
Now, that being said, if you want something a little nicer, of course I can charge you a little more as the tavern keeper in the 18th century. And that's really where people in that particular profession are making their money, um, by uh, being able to offer you a little something extra. Earlier when I had mentioned about how this shilling might buy you a meal in a tavern, that could be one of 800 of these that you earn in an entire year. Let's say if you had an average income of about 40 pounds and there are 20 shillings in every pound, so you get 800 of these coins. Would you be willing to spend one of these 800 if it, all that it got you was a meal? So you'd have to decide, is that worth it? Uh, if you were a poor farmer living out in the countryside somewhere, maybe you only earn 20 pounds a year. If you're the royal governor of Virginia, your annual salary is 2,000 pounds a year. So it all depends on who you are, what you think of as being expensive or inexpensive. I like food, so I'd be willing to spend that <laughs> shilling. <laughs> Uh, well, we are, uh, this is a good time to talk about primary sources, actually. Uh, primary sources are things uh, from the 18th century, like letters, account books, and newspapers, uh, that can tell us firsthand what the past was like. Uh, we've already discussed a few primary sources today that tell us more about the colonial economy, but I'd like to take a more in-depth look at one particular source that Rebecca has made good use of in the milliner's shop. Uh, since we've been talking so much about shopping, um, Rebecca, can you tell us uh, how you use inventories to learn about 18, how 18th century people functioned in the colonial economy? Yeah, sure. So inventories are often taken if a person passes away and they don't leave behind a will. So there's nothing that's telling everyone else how they wanted their property to be distributed or who is meant to inherit it or how it will be used to settle any debts. So just like today, if somebody passes away and they don't leave behind a will with those instructions, they'll send in the probate courts to take an inventory to put a value on everything that that person owns. Um, and in the 18th century, they quite often include things like clothing in those inventories. Not so much today, because today our clothing doesn't really have a resale value, but it did in the 18th century. Um, which meant that quite often you'll find people's wardrobes indicated on that list of goods that they leave behind when they pass away. And we have an inventory for a lady named Mary Cooley, who we know was a nurse and a midwife, so she was a working lady. And when she passed away, she was a widow, so her husband had died a few years before, and she left behind a minor child, so she had a very young son that needed to be taken care of. And that's why they made the inventory, to see what was there to support that young child until he got old enough to work for himself. Um, and in her inventory, it tells us that she had quite a nice wardrobe and actually quite a nice set of household goods. So she actually had 10 gowns when she passed away. She had nine shifts, which is like a, a um, kind of big t-shirt that we ladies wear underneath our clothes. She had three pairs of shoes. She had uh, 15 caps to decorate her hair. Um, and then she had a whole bunch of really nice furniture, some kitchen equipment. And the, what that inventory also tells us is that she owned one enslaved woman and also one enslaved child. So those people are listed as property right alongside all of those other material items that she owned. So by looking at Mary Cooley's inventory, we can tell a lot about maybe her lifestyle, about what was important to her, and what she chose to spend her money on. Um, and for us working in a millinery shop and trying to understand how much clothing people were willing to buy, that tells us that for Mary Cooley, fashion was pretty important to her. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of inventories, so when it comes to kind of trying to get a sense of what we might call the average size of a wardrobe. We just don't have enough inventories that survive that will tell us, say, that Mary Cooley was very common for a working woman, or that Mary Cooley really liked fashion and spent more than her neighbor did on her clothes, or that Mary Cooley really didn't like fashion and her neighbors actually had twice as many gowns as she has on her inventory. So while inventories are really good sources, like any primary source, we have to understand the context. We have to understand all of the other um, kind of contributing factors that will help us to understand that document and what it's trying to tell us. They are very important, that is for sure. Uh, we do have another question coming in from uh, the fifth grade class in San Diego. Uh, they want to know, why was tobacco so popular? Huh. Uh, tobacco is something that had been used by the, the native inhabitants of North and, and Central and South America for 
hundreds, if not thousands of years before European colonists began arriving on this side of the Atlantic. And almost uh, immediately, you begin to see the European explorers, the, the colonizers, sending tobacco back to Europe. And then from there, it spreads to Africa. It goes to Asia. Uh, in, even in China, they begin taking tobacco in, in all sorts of different forms. Uh, today, we know that tobacco has some very unhealthy side effects for people who, who use that, whether it's by smoking it or, or chewing it or uh, you can grind it into a, the dust and inhale it. That was a way that was very popular among the English. Um, and it would cause a sensation, kind of like if, if you drink a, a soda and it has lots of sugar in it and it makes you feel very energetic, that's something similar to what tobacco can cause some people to experience as well. So it was a, a stimulant. Uh, it, it was because of the way it made people feel that made them uh, so fond of tobacco. Excellent. Um, we do have a question from uh, Katie from Mrs. Wise's class in South Carolina who asks, how much would tobacco cost for the colonists? Uh, well, I don't have a particular price for tobacco. I can say that it's uh, sort of a, um, it's a, an extra, a luxury. Um, and I think it's interesting that the economy works in this way where Virginia is producing the tobacco and that's where Virginians are making their money by and far. They're selling the tobacco to people in Europe. Now those people in Europe are gonna process it and then sell it back to us here in Virginia. And that's really important to understand because it shows you that it's not just, the economy isn't just going one way. It's a full circle of these products that we are producing, um, sending away and then they're coming back to us and we're buying them again. We have a class of seventh graders in Hernando, Florida who would like to know more about slavery within the 18th century economy. So um, I think it's important to remember that uh, the buying and selling of people was a huge part of the economy in the 18th century. We're not just talking about the stuff those people are producing, we're talking about the people in themselves. Um, there is a, a trade in that, and then even after there is a trade in that, um, there are still um, sales of, of real people here in Williamsburg in the 18th century. Now, on top of that, this tobacco economy, as Cash mentioned, is very um, laborious. It takes a lot of work and effort to um, handle this crop, and so the institution of slavery is ingrained in the Virginia economy because um, very early Virginia began to rely on the labor that enslaved people. So that's people who are not paid are producing in order to make this economy function. Yeah, and we also know that here in Williamsburg in a city, so not out, say, on a, a larger farm or a plantation that's growing that tobacco, but even in a city like Williamsburg, where most of the people are merchants or tradespeople, um, you're looking at about four-fifths of the households in a city like Williamsburg own at least one person who was enslaved. So about 52% of the population of Williamsburg was enslaved, so over half of the people here, which means that half of the economy, half of the people that have sometimes an opportunity to participate in that economy are enslaved. And here in a city like Williamsburg, quite often you'll find enslaved individuals who have specialized skill sets that they're able to sell, say if their, their master or their mistress gives them time at the end of the day, that free time is theirs to use to maybe earn a little bit of extra money. So somebody who knows how to play the fiddle might hire himself out to work in one of the taverns and earn some money that way. Um, somebody who knows how to do laundry might take in some of the laundry for some of the travelers to the city and earn some money that way. And that allows them kind of the agency, the ability to shop right alongside those free white individuals that are also making purchases in shops and to sort of pick and choose and be able to, to decide on what they want to buy for themselves. And under English law, legally, an enslaved person is considered property. But under Virginia tradition, whatever that person buys for him or herself is considered theirs. So even though technically speaking they're property, Virginians will understand that if they make some money and they spend that money for themselves, 
they can own those things that they might use to say decorate their bodies or make a statement about who they are or what's important to them by the purchases that they'll choose to make in shops. I, I think it's also important to remember that slavery is an institution that exists in every colony on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, not only in the southern colonies, but uh, up and down the coast, uh, Brown University in Rhode Island is funded from the slave trade. There was a, a terrible uh, uprising, a, a riot in New York City in the 1740s that resulted in the, the execution of several enslaved persons. So it's a, a, it's a terrible institution that influences the history of our entire nation, that we, we still reckon with the, the results of it today. We do have a, another seventh grader uh, asking us where American Indians fit into the colonial economy here in Virginia. That's a really good question. Um, so here in Williamsburg, uh, keep in mind there had been relationships developed between American Indian nations like the Pamunkey, for example, um, for a couple hundred years at this point. So um, those relationships are pretty ingrained. If you walked into the coffee house here in Williamsburg in the 1760s, you'd perhaps meet somebody from one of those American Indian nations buying and selling um, uh, fish, for example is something that we know was happening here. Um, but there's also other nations, um, like for example the Cherokee Nation, that would do business trade with um, Indian traders, so people who made it their job to trade back and forth with those nations. Um, it's also really important to remember that there are lots of different American Indian nations, so it's um, every um, group of people had their own identity and their own relationships back and forth with all of the different colonies they interacted with. So there's really no one size fits all um, for American Indians as a whole. You have to look at individual nations um, and relationships. And, you know, if, if you are interested in this topic and you want more information, join us next Tuesday, uh, November 2nd at 1 p.m. Eastern for Trades Tuesday, which will be all about the Indian trade. Uh, we do have another question here from our fifth graders in San Diego uh, who are asking, why was it so common for women to own taverns? <laughs> I love this question. Um, so when you look at tavern keeping, the things it's doing is sort of an extension of what women are already doing here in a city like this one in the 18th century. Um, things like um, uh, providing food and lodging is a pretty easy step beyond providing a household. Uh, even some of the men who are listed as tavern keepers in Williamsburg have so many other things on their plate. Some of them are also tradesmen in their own right that we think that they're probably listed as the tavern keeper, but their wife is the one who's actually managing that business. Um, I play a tavern keeper named Rachel Whitaker. We're not sure that she was a tavern keeper for sure, but I've chosen to make that her profession because her parents were tavern keepers and then she became a widow, her husband died. I don't know what she was doing to make a living, but I know that she was still here in Williamsburg and able to support herself and her son, so it seems to me a logical um, conclusion that she might have been doing the same thing she was taught to do. Um, so yes, there are lots of tavern keepers here, um, and it really, uh, many of them are women, it really I think it has to do with the fact that that's something that um, women already knew how to do. And there are a lot of, it's important to note too, there are a lot of other traits that have women mm -hmm. represented in them. It's not just tavern keeping, uh, tavern keeping excuse me, uh, that women would have been doing. It's also um, you know, being milliners, being mantle makers, being laundresses, being hairdressers, um, being a lady's maid. There are a lot of other trades that are dominated by female labor. Mm -hmm. um, there are also a lot of trades that are dominated by male labor, by men working in them. But there are women who are also working in those trades. So you might find a female tailor. Uh, you might find a female blacksmith. You might find a female silversmith or a female tinsmith. Um, so that's one of the things that we like to talk about here at Williamsburg today is the fact that you pretty much see everyone, men and women, working in every single trade in some capacity or another. Uh, we have a question from Eli from uh, Ms. Wise's class uh, who wants to know how many farms would there be per town? Ah. 
I, I think a good way to think about the uh, answer to that is more so how many towns are there for all of the farms. In Virginia, you see a lot more farms than you see of towns in, in this colony. Uh, and that's true throughout many of the southern colonies that they really build their economy on agriculture, on producing, uh, whether in Virginia it's tobacco or in South Carolina it's rice and indigo and in Pennsylvania it might be lumber or iron. So when you get into some of those northern colonies then you begin to see more small towns but also the size of the farms gets a lot smaller as well. They don't need as much land to produce some of the, the crops and, and the industries that they have in some of those northern colonies. There are entire counties in Virginia where there is no town. It's just a courthouse and maybe it's near a prominent crossroads and uh, maybe a store or a tavern nearby and that's it. Everything else in the entire county are just farms and plantations. Uh, we have a question from Garrett from South Carolina who asks, what jobs would make the most money in the 18th century? Huh. That's a good question, Garrett. Um, I, I uh, think that anything that requires an extra degree of skill is going to make you a little bit more money. Um, and also there are jobs and professions. So if you're a lawyer, that's gonna require you um, doing a fair bit of studying, a passing an exam to get your law license. And then you're probably gonna make a little bit extra money because of all of that as well. We do have a, a kind of a follow-up from one of our uh, fifth grade classes watching from San Diego. Uh, and they're asking great questions about some of the primary sources we've mentioned. Uh, for example, who had inventories like Mary Cooley's and how common are they? Mm -hmm. So if you um, die without a will, as Rebecca mentioned, it's called dying in testate, and basically that means they're going to go through your house and see what you own. Um, I have an inventory from the tavern keeper, Rachel Whitaker's husband, that says what he owned. He was a brick maker, so, um, and a brick layer. He was a mason. So most of what he owned had to do with his trade, and then he had some household goods. Um, but there are other sources you can look at too. For example, um, if you have a ledger book um, like this one, and I think there's, yes, there's an image of one as well. Um, that is where you record every single day um, what you're buying and what you're selling. The credit you have and the p things that, p the debt you have, that what people owe you. Um, this is really important. Because if you need to go to court, take someone to court and um, tell them that they owe you money, sue them for money, this is your evidence um, that they owe you money. So this is another really important primary source document. Uh, the, there's a little bit more to this too. Uh, they're, they're asking uh, about how are the goods listed in the inventories being made, uh, specifically the clothing. And I uh, mean, maybe you want to mention some of your own as well. Yeah, sure. So in inventories like Mary Cooley's, what's What's interesting and what gets really complicated is the clothing because we know in the 18th century that clothing had value because of the fabric that it was made out of, not because of the style that it was in, not because of the labor that somebody's hands put into that fabric to turn it into something you could actually use, but because of the fabric that was contained in that garment. So that's the reason why in the 18th century, rich or poor, free or enslaved, it didn't matter who you were, a professional person made your clothes because their labor wasn't worth a lot. But in those inventories, we see clothing listed because the fabric still has value. So if somebody, you know, like your great grandmother leaves you her favorite gown when she passes away, she knows that your, you know, her gown from 1720 is not going to be fashionable in 1776, but she knows that she's leaving you a really nice piece of fabric that you can take to your mantua maker, to your dressmaker, have her take out all the stitches that went into it. We can throw away the labor, that's the cheap part. We'll spread out the fabric pieces flat again and then see what kind of fabric we have there to work with. And we can make a whole brand new gown out of great grandma's fabric that you don't have to pay for because all you pay for is my labor that second time around. So the 18th century kind of upcycles with fabric before upcycling even has a word. Um, they're reusing that fabric because that's where the value is. And that's why we find clothing listed on inventories is because it actually retains its use value as it goes from person to person to person to person. 
person. So it's really interesting looking at inventories and realizing that the reason why things get listed is because they can be sold again, they can be used again. We think about our clothes today and if we don't want anything today, we throw it away because it doesn't have any secondary value. It's so expensive to pay somebody who has a specialized skill set today to fix a hole in your t-shirt. But the fabric's not worth anything. We get a hole in our t-shirt, we throw it away. If the 18th century got a hole in their fabric, because that fabric was so expensive, it's worth paying somebody's time to fix that hole and make the fabric continue to be useful. Excellent, and we are to our last audience question. Uh, we have Natalie asking, uh, to split a shilling, did they have a coin splitter or did they have to have a, a really good eye? How does that work exactly? Well, you know, if you took a, a Spanish mill dollar, and, and you can see the picture of it uh, again as well, just like the one that I've got here, uh, you can see on the screen, uh, it's a pretty large silver coin. If you were to cut that coin in half with a, a saw or uh, a knife, you know, if you saw bread, or not saw bread, if you, if you <laughs> cut a loaf of bread, you get crumbs. Well, if you cut silver coin like that, you would get a bunch of silver filings or silver dust. And even though it's made of silver, it's still worth something. So you would want to cut it as cleanly as possible. So to do that, they could use a big set of shears. They look like giant scissors to just cut it right in half to make that half dollar. You could also uh, put it on a, a big block or an anvil and then strike it with a hammer and a chisel to come down to cut it into not just a half dollar like this, but you could also cut it again to make it a quarter dollar. You could cut it again to make an eighth of a dollar. Uh, it starts to look like a pie that's been sliced up after a while. Uh, so you could even wind up with a bunch of silver or gold dust and even though it's dust, it's still worth something because of what it's made of. And we are actually almost out of time, but before we wrap up, we know that there are a lot of myths about the 18th century, and we want each of you to discuss a myth that you want to bust uh, about the colonial economy. Uh, Cash, why don't you get started? <laughs> sure. Uh, I remember growing up and reading books about how people living in colonial America would barter. They would trade some chickens to get a new cooking pot and uh, nobody ever used any money. They just traded stuff back and forth and it's just baloney. <laughs> if, if I had a bunch of chickens that I needed to sell, I would find someone to buy the chickens and then hopefully they would give me some money, but if they didn't, they would probably give me credit in their store. Uh, they might give me a letter of exchange. They'd, they'd give me something in return for those chickens that I was going to sell. And then once I had that, I could take it into a store and, and buy a new cooking pot. So bartering happens, but it happens very infrequently. Just about everybody's going to be exchanging some kind of, of money or, or other currency. I would love to talk about the idea of um, homemade clothes or um, homespun clothes. Uh, we have this idea that during the revolution, people were making their own stuff. And it's really uh, not true. Most of what we got came from other places. It came from um, Europe. Um, even during the war, we're still importing things from Europe. And if you're wearing something that was made in the colonies or made in Virginia, you're probably doing it for a political purpose. I'm wearing a gown today that has a very expensive imported cotton fabric that's printed and then this little waistcoat that I'm wearing is made from what we call Virginia cloth it's linen diapering made right here in Williamsburg actually by our weaver shop down the street now I wear this when I'm playing Patrick Henry's wife because it is a very bold statement about wanting to be self-sufficient and um, a self-sufficient republic here in the colonies so um, it's to make a point but it's not common <laughs> 
And one of the questions that we get asked most frequently in, in our shop, in our millinery shop, is, is um, you know, who would be able to come into a shop like this? Was it only the wealthy people that had the ability to come into a store and to buy things and to take things home? Um, and the answer is that shopping was pretty democratic in the 18th century, very much like it is today. I mean, if you don't have money, you have credit to spend, and everyone um, really has some form of credit, whether it's by bringing in goods that you're you know, exchanging for credit in that account book, or whether it's in bringing in a letter of credit uh, from somebody in your community that says this person is very honest and you can trust them to take things out of your shop and they'll pay you back eventually. Um, so we're finding people rich or poor, free or enslaved, it doesn't matter. Everybody's shopping right alongside each other in shops uh, like, like you would have found here in a capital city like Williamsburg. And we do have a lot of account books and ledger books um, from merchants uh, here around the colony of Virginia um, that do indicate that enslaved people did have credit accounts um, right alongside their free white counterparts. So everyone was participating in that economy. Everyone wanted that agency and everybody wanted to be able to have that ability to say, I like this, this says something about me and I wanna make this a part of my lifestyle. Wonderful. Well, we are just about out of time. So thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of CW Kids Ask and for sending us so many awesome questions. We encourage you to look around for the rest of today and think about all the ways you yourself are acting within our modern global economy and compare your experience to the experiences of the people of the past. Uh, this project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I do want to say thank you to Emily, Cash, and Rebecca for joining us today. Don't forget to watch our next episode on November 10th when we'll talk about how different kids fit into colonial society. Uh, until then, have a great day.